Atlas of Finance um, wasn't my idea. It was actually um, the lead author, Derek's kind of brainchild. He is an economic geographer based in Oxford. When he started the project, he's now at the National University of Singapore. And he's a real kind of map fanatic, but he didn't really have the cartographic background and training in data visualization to bring his dream, which was to create an atlas of financial geography to reality. So he got a recommendation to me and my colleague, Oliver Uberti, who's a designer. And really, we kind of fleshed out this plan for creating the first atlas of its kind that showed the financial world from a geographic perspective. He really kind of drove us to realize that ambition and create the finished book. Almost five years ago, he um, visited my office and he had this idea. He was imagining it to take a few weeks work. Here we are five years later and the book's finally uh, out there. My background is in geography, but it's not financial geography. So I'm not an expert in any of the particular topics. Working on the book was a real learning experience for me to understand these different data sets and these different ideas. What really came through to me is the importance that geography still has in, in the world of finance. We sometimes talk about sort of the death of distance and the idea that people can communicate over Zoom. They don't have to be in the same place all the time to interact, you know, and the internet has shrunk the world. But there are still so many different examples where geography matters, where one country behaves differently from another. And that creates disparities, which then creates opportunities and risks in the world of finance. And I think my favorite kind of reminder of that is this example, the uh, need to connect trading centers between uh, Chicago and New York uh, as quickly as possible because the New York Stock Exchange, if you can, can get information from Chicago a bit quicker on the futures trading market, uh, which is more based in Chicago, you get an advantage in the trading systems and, and you can profit from that. These uh, insane lengths that companies go to to get data connections between these two hubs using microwave transmitters and fiber optic cables and all that kind of stuff to get it as fast as possible in order to secure that advantage I thought was just amazing because again it's a classic example where actually distance is the problem there that they're trying to solve it is a geographical problem they need to get data as quickly as possible from one point on the earth's surface to another and those who win that race get to profit from it. The challenge with any kind of map making is to establish what you keep in and what you take out. And some people might say, well, doing a kind of a physical printed book uh, is quite an old fashioned idea, you know, printing a, a, a sort of a paper atlas from high tech data is a slightly odd thing to do. But one of the nice things about the idea of a printed atlas, and one of the reasons I still think they're fantastic communication tool is that you know what your constraints are you know the size of your page you know how much you can fit on it you're not trying to design for multiple different screen sizes we're not worrying about how something might look on a 50 inch tv versus a, an iphone screen and what that enables you to do is take some really strong editorial decisions about how much detail you include on the page how you shape and format a graphic or a visual to make it fit. That was a lot of my role sitting back behind the scenes, Oliver. He and I work very closely together and that's how we've done previous books. He kind of gives us the parameters we have to work with. My role in the project was going back to these experts and saying to them, right, you have this mega database and there's about 50 different things we can look at in this database. How are we going to distill this down into a single story so the storytelling is established at the beginning of the process and then that informs the data processing which then helps inform the design and so on and so forth and what normally happens actually is someone has created the map that they think is the final map or a graph or a chart or anything um, the expert creates it they then actually hand it off to a designer who then has to work out how to fit it on a page and into a report or book. And these things aren't always compatible. And so they never quite look right. Being able to design stuff from the ground up 
in collaboration with Oliver, but also going back to the research team and saying, these are our constraints, how are we going to distill the story down into a message that can be communicated in this way was really the kind of what makes this, I think, stand out so tightly integrated. It's one of those things that I can't claim much of the credit for. It's something that Oliver the book's designer kind of focused a lot on. So it's a book about money and finance. So why don't we make the book look like money? Use some of the techniques they use in banknotes to inspire the colors and the rendering of the images and then um, pick a consistent color palette that we use throughout the book. The whole point is really to create something that's greater than the sum of its constituent parts. And you can do that in a book. You can tie it all together really nicely so that every single page you know that it's come from this particular atlas and the success of these things hinges on how well you pull that together that's kind of the framework but in terms of getting the final visual together we have this kind of mantra that we we, we repeat again and again and again for every graphic which is the topic the data the angle the form and what we mean by that is is there a topic that we're interested in? So are we interested in, for example, inequality in credit ratings across the US? That's one of the graphics in the book that I really like. That's the potential topic that we're interested in. Can we get the data that's robust enough to tell a story with that particular topic? And then what angle are we approaching this from? What's the story we're telling through the data? And then the final thing is the form, and that can really dictate how the finished product looks. So in the case of the credit example, we have a fairly simple map of the US actually, but it's quite a powerful one. You can only really get there with that process. You know, if you didn't have the data to support the idea, that's a problem. Each idea goes through that process. And I think in the end, we had twice as many ideas as went in the final book because half the ideas just didn't make it through that process. So Oliver and I have co-authored three books previously. We're used to that kind of exciting moment when the first copy of the book comes through the post and you open it and you hold the thing in your hand and you just admire the work that you've done in it. This book is just amazing how, how good a job Yale and the production team have done in the finished product. I took it to a conference a couple of weeks ago and, and you take it out of your bag and attracts people to it. So I was just really pleased with that. Unlike with, with previous books I've worked on, I've actually been directly involved up until the last minute, checking stuff and, and working on things. But because this was such a large collaborative project, a year or even 18 months, it may have been a bit more than that before the, the final printing happened. And so it was an even bigger surprise when the final thing came through the post. And I think that's important. I think that the object, I think, is important because these things are, are nice to hold and flick through and look at rather than being dependent on screen. And the second thing that I really take away from the project and that I really enjoyed is it's really educational for the team. One of the things you find with academics, and I suspect it's probably true actually in, in all walks of life, is some people are quite reluctant and hesitant to iterate through ideas, keep trying and keep trying, particularly when they're trying to visualise something. And the co-authors were really open-minded to this process and I think got a lot out of it. I mean, I learned a lot from them about financial geography, but they learned a lot about visualization and design. And I think that's created a whole series of ambassadors because those of us who do visualizations and work with the kinds of data that we work with, it's easy to overlook how much work goes into creating a good visualization. And the best visualizations look kind of effortless when they're finished, um, but often they're the ones that take the most work. So that's nice to be able to share that journey with a, a new group of people. The football one was at the furthest margins of my uh, interest and expertise, so I can't claim understanding football. But my key takeaway from, from that is actually the idea that football players are sort of assets now that can be traded. I think that we do a fantastic job of showing why there's so much money in football and how these assets are, are traded. So it's a book about finance. We have to have a graphic about coins in there and the earliest coins and all, you know, and, and the spread of Roman coins. But that was one where we visualized it initially. And then we found that there were maybe some slightly 
odd anomalous things that were coming up in the visualization coins in surprising places and there was a i think a lot of dialogue between the uh, researchers that supplied that data set just to make sure it was really robust and that the researchers themselves were happy with both the final graphic and then the interpretation of it there are so many different topics in it no one is the world expert necessarily on every single topic that they've talked about So checking with people that are the world expert on this stuff is important as well. The Roman coin one was was actually quite an iterative example where actually it's quite a simple map. It's just sort of dots that show counts of where the coins have found, but it was one that took quite a lot of iteration. I think the one that stands out to me, um, and actually it was highlighted, I think, in a a review in the Irish Times yesterday as well, um, is the credit... Uh, ratings one for the US. It stands out to me because it shows in a slightly indirect way what the manifestations of inequality are in a variety of different ways. We've just shown a map of how uh, consumers, individuals within particular counties are rated according to their credit score. You get these big discrepancies between um, certain parts of the US. So the South tends to have fewer people with good ratings and then more affluent parts of the US, you get more people that have higher ratings. And it kind of manifests itself as sort of these entrenched inequalities that exist in the system. If you can't access credit to buy a a house or even a car or something like that, then that really holds you back. And that is something that I think often gets, for those who are in a privileged position, able to access credit, they take it for granted that they can do that. They can get a mortgage for a house or whatever. Um, but these issues actually are long lasting and, and entrenched, you know, and they go way back to issues around segregation in the US manifesting themselves into the present day. So I think it's actually a very nice encapsulation of a whole series of societal problems and an invitation really to think about, think a bit more creatively how things like credit and stuff is scored and allocated the question I often get asked me is, well, it's great for you. You've got this great team. You've got a fantastic designer. You know, you've got all these experts together. It's easy for you to say, well, everyone should do better data visualizations. How do I take away things that are in this book and how can I bring it into my day-to-day work? The answer I always give to that is, The thinking should always be the same. You know, the aspiration may be slightly different, but even if we're creating small visuals, you know, we're still looking to persuade people of an idea, potentially. We're still looking to find new insights into something. We're we're always looking to bring people with us when we're creating data visualizations. And so thinking through the tools and the techniques that we deployed in this atlas, how is it that we use this particular graphic to tell a story. It seems that they've left quite a lot of data out of this particular graphic, Um, but I can understand why, because it helps people focus on the stuff that really matters. That kind of interrogation and kind of inspiration uh, from these books, I think is a really valuable thing, because even if it's a small thing, like adding a a caption or an annotation to a simple scatter chart or using a, a bar chart to show something rather than a pie chart can make a huge difference. Once you get into the kind of routine of doing that, you'll find that your visuals are much more compelling and you're having a much bigger impact on the people that you're communicating them to, be it, you know, the person you're sat next to or a room full of people at a particular meeting or with a client. So I think that's a useful kind of extra bit of insight into how I think these books should be used and actually how I use them in my teaching. <laughs>